Let's ask the Lord to bless us, and hopefully we'll come away better prepared to draw near to God and His people. Lord, thank you for a beautiful morning, for the ability to learn, and for what you've already taught us. And so now, Lord, I'm praying that in the mixture of things that we talk about here, we think about here, that your word will shed more light on the journey for us individually or for us as a church. And I'm praying, Father, that we would know a greater joy because we've learned how to draw near to you and to each other in the proper ways. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. If you have your Bibles, open them, if you would, to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I want to lay a theological foundation for what I'm going to say. John 17 is the prayer of Jesus. And that prayer, I think, encapsulates some very important uh, starting points for our discussion. John 17. And I'm going to go down to about verse 20. John 17. We'll start with verse 16. It says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I've also sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, I want to start with this premise. Jesus is praying for his people, and he believes that the world will be able to recognize them by their connection to him and by their oneness. His prayer in verse 21 is that they may be one even as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. That they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, it's the easiest thing in the world to fight and come apart and not be connected. As a matter of fact, we know from the law of physics that everything goes from a state of order to disorder. So everything falls apart on its own. It doesn't need any help. But I believe what Jesus is saying here is that the kind of oneness that the Trinity has, okay, that the Godhead, to use a more appropriate word, that that oneness is to be the oneness that we have with God and that we have with each other so that the world can see incontrovertible evidence. Now, there's nothing like being a part of a group that's very dysfunctional. And, and listen, we're in, a, we're in a state of flux. We're all in a little bit of a different state of personal development, relational development, spiritual maturity, relational maturity. But if there's one thing that's attractive to people, it's being a part of something that is sweet and harmonious and focused and structured. Now, imagine if one of the primary ways the world's going to take note that something heavenly is on earth and it's through oneness, imagine what the devil must have as a goal, which is to disunify and take away that oneness. And I'm a pastor, and I've pastored different churches, and I can tell you some of them robbed me of energy. And some of them give me energy. Now, it's my job when God sends me to a church to accept the, the group of people I have and to do something with them. So the one thing I need to tell you as I'm thinking through the list of churches I've pastored is that every church, like every family, has a DNA. And some of their DNA is bad for generations. No, I'm serious. It really is. Their DNA has been bad for generations. And 
I won't tell this church. I've only pastored in two conferences, so anybody that knows me well might be able to track me down and figure it out. But I can remember one church, its DNA was so bad that I can remember driving down to the church, a rural church, and I'm just feeling like there's nothing in me to go minister to these people. And every time I'm with them, it's like they're dragging, sucking the life out of me. Unity has many variables that are required to, for it to be achieved. What I hope when we're done here, and what I'm going to do in session one is I'm going to talk in general about unity. In session two, I'm going to talk about problem solving to protect and establish unity. Because most Christians don't understand the prerequisites for good problem solving. I could have said fighting. I could have said arguing. Those are all ugly words. I could have said conflict resolution. But there is actually laws, there are actually laws that govern proper resolutions of problems. And those laws are in God's word. And the experience that we need is the experience with Christ. So in this first session, I'm going to talk about bonding. In the second session after lunch, I'm going to talk about how to solve problems. Because in any relationship, you come to a point where you bump into each other. It doesn't matter if it's a marriage or parenting or a church board or another board or your employer. Every relationship you have, you come to a place where there's an issue. And the difference between well-bonded and deepening bonding people and poorly bonded people is not only the broad foundation of what creates the potential for unity, but it's also the ability to get past the things that come in naturally that will try to stop you from being more emotionally bonded with the people around you. So I think what I'm going to do is also communicate here on the front side of this because I'm... I'm going to intersperse this with a couple different things. Uh, my main goal in the end, uh, this is not a marriage seminar, although my wife and I do them. And, but I'm going to tell you that the key to bonding is emotional intimacy with God. Now, if you don't have a personal living relationship with God, your ability to bond with the people around you isn't going past what your ability to bond with God is. Because God already knows you from the inside out, from the DNA on up. If you read Psalm 139, he knows when you're going to get up, when you're going to lie down, what you're going to say. You can't run away. The dark is light to him. He knit you together in your mother's room. You know the book of Matthew. He knows the number of hairs. I believe he knows how many times your heart's going to beat, how many breaths you're going to take. So for people who want a bond, and they want that bond to deepen, they have to have an environment in which they can grow personally. Now, nobody grows in isolation. The Bible says in Proverbs 18.1 that a, a fool isolates himself and rages against all sound wisdom. So I'm kind of saying two things that sound like opposites right from the very beginning, but they're not. My walk with Christ is primarily personal and, and intimate God in me. He can read my mind. I'm learning about myself from God. But I can tell you the next relationship that defines my ability to bond is my marriage. And I'm learning about myself from my wife. Now, of course, she's learning about things from me. But what I want you to understand is that bonding is, is intrinsically a relational process. And the safest place for you to grow personally and to find strength to sacrifice and grow is in your walk with God. So if you're not making time to be alone with God and do a little reading and praying and thinking, then you're missing out on some of the key epiphanies, those moments of aha. So I want to start by saying that from the very beginning. Your ability to bond, whether it's in marriage, which is the next most intimate relationship there is, is directly related to your personal emotional trajectory or graph with God. And God's not going to leave you alone. As a matter of fact, God's going to bring you, if life is a mountain and you're climbing it on that upward way, you're going to come to places in your life where you run into something hard. 
Okay, let's say your husband triggers a feeling of rejection that makes you think of your childhood. And by the way, your family systems are very important. You have to be honest about your family systems. I talked to you about my family system um, in the first sermon. And I'm going to tell you, in my family system, um, I brought some things to my marriage which were not good. And my wife came from a much better home, raised a Seventh-day Adventist. Mom was a stay-at-home mom. Dad worked for the denomination as an educational superintendent. She brought so much less baggage to the marriage than I did. There were some things that I needed to hear from her that needed to be changed in me. And there were some things, not as many, but a few things in, in her life. And of course, that's an ongoing process. It's all very fluid. But your family system, your walk with God, your marriage, these things are, some of them are not variables you can change. The family system you came out of, you're not going to change that. Now, you can change how you relate to it, but you're not going to change what it was. It is what it was. And your family system may be, the mold may be more twisted than somebody else's. But what I want you to know going into a, a, a session on bonding is that bonding is a journey of emotional intimacy properly defined by whatever relationship it is. My bond with God is supposed to come before my bond with my wife. That's what Jesus said. I'm not supposed to love anybody more than, than him. Then my bond to my wife is stronger than my bond to my kids. And mothers, your bond to your husband needs to be stronger than your bond to your kids. And what will often happen is, especially in a bad marriage, is the adults will start bonding more with the kids, especially as the kids mature. It, but it's a deceptive bond. It's, it's a dysfunctional bond. So if we are to reflect God in his essence, if we're to be one with each other in a similar way that Jesus was one with the Father, that means the bond of the Godhead is really something that humanity is supposed to experience and the devil hates so he's going to try to keep that bond from developing. But what we're committed to is a journey of growth to where what stops the bonding, we can remove. We can choose to remove. When I was, uh, and, and I'll also say this, a good bonded environment requires good leadership. I told you about my grandfather, who when he got drunk at least one time, chased my mother and my two aunts and my grandmother around the house with a butcher knife. He traumatized their ability to feel safe with him, especially if there was a beer can sitting next to his TV chair. That limited at some level my, wife, my mother's ability to bond with us. My mother is not a naturally affectionate woman. Now, I never doubted my mother's love, not once in all of my life. I never, I still don't. Uh, she's a stubborn woman and sometimes difficult. And uh, even after becoming a Christian, she's not past some of those dynamics. And you can imagine the apple didn't fall too far from the tree, okay? So probably some of my enemies would say the same thing about me, although my mother's not my enemy. But my mother was not, and still to this day, does not remain an affectionate woman. Now, every night before I'd go to bed, I'd give my mother a kiss, my father a kiss, but I didn't grow up in an affectionate home. Now, my wife, on the other hand, grew up in an exceptionally affectionate home. And there can be no doubt that one of the things that attracted me to my wife was that she is a free-flowing well of affection. And I feel like I'm, I'm constantly in the affection zone with her, whether it's words or touch or little notes. When I got here, my wife sends a little meal with me. I, we're frugal people, so we have this amazing job to win the world, so we're trying not to waste our money. She sends me a little lunch, and almost always in my lunch or in my luggage, there's going to be a little note. And sure enough, there was a card in there. I opened it up. These kinds of things are what make life rich. Now, when I became a pastor, I then became, as it were, kind of the father figure, a spiritual leader of the churches. And I'm here to tell you that good bonding requires good structure. 
So let's talk, in the neck, let's talk in the neighborhood of the church. You cannot have a bonded church that is not properly structured. So if the two head elders are fighting for who's in charge of the church, like the first two were out of three in my church when I was 27 years old and became the pastor of these three little country churches, if they're fighting over who's going to be the leader, that church is not going to be able to bond. And I can tell you, in every church that I inherited, I don't think I've ever inherited a healthy church. I hope I've handed off some healthy churches. I believe I have. But one of the things that had to be established was structure and order. So in every, almost every church I've been in, there's been an order-defining moment for my leadership. Now, I'm talking to all of you right now. There's probably not very many pastors here, but there's a number of church leaders and board members and members. But you're not going to have a healthy, defined church if you don't have good structure. Do you remember when Joshua became the leader of Israel? God told him at least four times, be strong and of good courage. And then when you read chapter 1, you get to the last part of the chapter. Let's turn there. It'd be better for us to read it than for me to explain it to you. Go to the book of Joshua, chapter 1. If you want a well-bonded church, you have to accept and pray for good leadership because the leadership creates the strength for people to know when they're in their lane and when they're out of their lane. And since we have a devil who's constantly trying to divide and disrupt, this is important. When you come to the end of chapter 1 of Joshua, you get to verse 16. And he's challenged the leaders, and now they're going to say something to him. Verse 16, they answered Joshua saying, all that you have commanded us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, we will obey you. Now that's a slight overstatement, okay? I don't think they obeyed Moses in all things. But in the end, they did. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your command and does not obey your words and all that you command him, he shall be put to death, only be strong and of good courage. Now, what I want you to see is that when you structure your leadership of your church properly, and of course, we don't practice the same method today. <laughs> we don't have executions for rebels and troublemakers. But in effect, what was being said to Joshua was, God's appointed you as the leader. Be strong and of good courage. We will support you. Of course, it's not supposed to be a blind support. But there was a structure put in place to where there's not this vine for who the leader is. Every, most every church I've come to, there's been some kind of crisis at the beginning to determine whether or not I will get to be the leader. I went to one church, sizable church, 300 and some members. And there were some well-to-do people in the church who did not understand relational law and they were not spiritually or relationally very mature. And unfortunately, it shows up in their family. Of course, I stayed in that church for almost 20 years. And 20 years is long enough to study a generation. And it wasn't that God didn't give me, or I shouldn't say that, it wasn't that I didn't have opportunities to go somewhere else. I did, but I always put it before the Lord, and the Lord allowed me to raise my children in this church. It was a very wonderful church. Uh, it didn't start out that way. It started out broke, dysfunctional, without vision, without unity. And so this couple came to the head elder, and by the way, the head elder, uh, he's still alive. He's an aged man now. But the head elder was not a dynamic leader. He was a solid Christian, though, and he shunned conflict. But in the early days of my ministry, the couple came to the head elder, and they were feeling threatened by my leadership. And they said to the head elder, either he goes or we go. Now, that's a pretty critical moment. At least one of them's a member of the board. They make good money. They work for the government. And the church had money problems. So the last thing you want to do is see major contributors leave. And the head elder, uh, you'd have to know him to know how amazing his next statement is. The head elder, this conflict averse, very phlegmatic uh, person says, well, I guess you'll have to go then. 
Now, I'm going to tell you the beauty is that they did not go. The person stayed on the board my whole, my whole time there until they, re, they resigned, which was probably 12 years into a 20-year tenure. And my wife would always say to me, it's good for you that that person is on the board. That person resisted everything I ever brought up on the board, almost to a word. Unfortunately, this person, I don't think, had that strong of a marriage because eventually a more astute person would have noticed that the board just kept ignoring them and following the leadership team of which I was structurally um, placed as head, not only by the conference, but by the elders and the other leaders. Now, that church went from being financially bankrupt. They had $8,000 in the bank, and they owed $13,000 to the conference. Now, if you had a business that had $8,000 in, in the bank and you owed somebody $13,000, you're upside down. And they would keep back the tithe. I hope none of your churches are doing this because they're cursed of God if they are. But they would hold back the tithe for about three weeks to pay their bills. And then come the end of the month, they would send their tithe to the conference office. They were not unified. They were not well-led. And they were struggling in every way because of it. If you want a well-bonded church, you must make sure that you work out whatever, whatever issues you have with pastoral leadership, elder leadership, whatever it might be. And sometimes a move is the only way to fix some of these things. That's the easy way out. But especially in the beginning, when you get a new pastor... You need to be sure that you fast and pray a few days before you get one so that you get the one you're supposed to get. Because there's a chemistry to a church family, and the chemistry and the abilities of the pastor and the elders are going to set the tone for how well the church can bond. In another church, I can remember sitting in the finance committee. Churches always struggle, I shouldn't say always, a lot of churches struggle with money. That's a very bad sign. I was sitting on a committee. I had been at the church about 13 months. I had been listening and learning. <laughs> what happened was, was that I had challenged that church in a finance committee, a large church. And I had said, you know, we got to stretch when we make this budget. We need to give an extra $1,000 to community services and an extra $1,000 to evangelism and an extra $1,000 to Christian education. And I was the new guy. That was, I, I was about four months there. Oh, $1,000. It was a big church. They're willing to do that. The real problem came the next year when it was time to make the budget. And the budget... We did not make it to budget, but we had received more money than the year before. So I said to the finance committee, I said, now we've got to stretch more. And that's when some people dug their heels in. But the Bible I read says that without faith, it's what? Impossible to please God. Because those that come to him must believe he exists and a reward of those who, who seek him. Now listen, I told you in the first sermon, I didn't want to be a pastor. I say that to my own shame. But once I decided I was going to do what God told me to do, I decided I wasn't going to play games. It's either going to work or not work. And my whole pastor, it's been an experiment. Because, number one, I didn't want to do it. And number two, I didn't want to do it the way I saw a lot of people doing it, which is playing all the games that churches play and getting nowhere. So in this finance committee, after being there 13 months, I decided we're going to have to shake things up a little bit because I'm not willing to be bound by their fear-derived and faithless dynamics of expanding the cause of God. And I hadn't asked them to jump the Grand Canyon in the standing broad jump, which is impossible. I just asked them to take a baby step. And then I asked them to take a toddler step. And when I, sa when I said, let's take a toddler step, they said no. And at that moment in time, there needed to be a little conflict. Because I knew either I was going to be bound by their poor culture for how they had run the church. 
or we were going to break out of that culture and we're going to do a whole lot better. Now, I'm here to tell you that in this church, the way the finance committee ran is the way the church ran, which was the one main goal was to save money. That's bad culture. They didn't put all the lights in the hanging chandeliers. One guy, this is Michigan, it's not South Africa, one of the assistant head deacons went into one of the bathrooms and put a piece of cardboard behind the return air vent in order to save money on the heating bill. What he didn't realize is that when the wind blew a certain way, the lack of warm air in the wall would burst the pipes, and probably all the money we ever saved while that cardboard was in there was spent and then some because we had to call in a plumber and we had a colossal mess. When I went to that church, the carpet was 50 years old, the telephone system didn't work, the sanitizer didn't work, the, t- the CD duplicator didn't work. It was, I, I'm just going to tell you, it's the church I'm in right now. <laughs> Over, well, it only had 900 members then. A big church. Structuring a church for unity means honoring the structures that should be honorable and honoring the ones who hold the structural places. Now, I'm going to tell you that creating unity in the second session this afternoon is about solving problems. And I'm going to tell you, just like that first person in the church that preceded that, stayed with the church board all those years, even though they said either he goes or I go. Some of these very same people that I had to have proper spiritual conflict with, they stayed with me. Some of them grew, eventually some of them left. When it comes to building unity in a church, you need these components. So I I wish I had all this in PowerPoint for you, but I didn't come prepared for that. Seven things. Number one, you are not going to achieve uh, unity in your church if your leadership team is not unified. So the pastors and the elders need to be of one mind on most things. I didn't say everything, but they need to be of one mind on most things. And I'm going to tell you, pastoring a church of now 1,100 and some members, my job is, in some respects, much easier than it was pastoring churches of 50 people. Because in a 1,100-member church in an Adventist ghetto, like where I live, where Andrews University is, If somebody doesn't like me, they can leave and go to one of the other dozen churches that were within five miles of my church. Most of my life, I pastored where it was a half-hour drive at least to the other church. And so people were stuck. They might have thought they were stuck with me. Sometimes I thought I was stuck with them, all right? You cannot put people in leadership positions who do not possess a a baseline level of relational and spiritual maturity. Now I'm going to say something that could be just a little bit controversial. When you constitute your church board, you need to know that years ago, Adventism practiced a different kind of church board constitution. Does anybody know this? It used to be that the churches were governed by the board of elders. But then over a period of time, we have switched to a different kind of church board, which is more of a representative-based church board, which means that when you pick up your church manual and you read through it, in the church manual, there are more people recommended to be on the church board than attend some of your churches. All right? And in America, we have a phrase that goes like this, every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Okay? The problem with constituting your church board like this is that some people that hold certain positions have been given those positions partially as an opportunity to grow and they're not nearly mature enough to handle the kind of conversations that need to happen in your leadership teams. Now, if you're in a little church or if you're in a church that's struggling with this, you need to understand that there is a philosophical dividing point in regards to constituting your leadership team that you should at least be aware of and your church should at least work through it. 
There are some people who use the church manual as an absolute, undeviating guide to how a church runs. And by and large, the church manual is the structure. It's the agreed upon way we go. But when it comes to some of these dynamics that are going to directly affect the unity of your church, especially in the segment on constituting the church board, I think you need to have a serious conversation as to whether or not how many positions are considered ex officio. In other words, by nature of office. Because there are some people, in little churches this is harder to do than big ones, but there are some people who even though they hold an office and the church manual says they should be on the board, everybody in your nominee committee knows they shouldn't be. Now there's no more delicate place to do business in a church than the nominating committee. And I wish I had time to talk to you about how to run an effective nominating committee. But I am here to tell you this, the bonding that I'm talking about with you right now will make every system in your church run better. And the higher the level of bonding, especially at the higher levels of leadership, the more effective all the rest of the leadership will be. Now, I've only made it to the first one, but I, I want to tell you that in all of my churches, we have run mission trips. And I can remember in the very first time, I went through college, I was poor. I got asked two times to leave Christian education because I didn't have enough money. But the God up above said, no, he's going to be a pastor. He's got to go to my school. So he kept me in, all right? I've learned to trust God and have faith. It doesn't mean I always trust him. But when it, when it comes to my churches, in my early 30s, I had somebody say to me, we ought to take a mission trip. I had been too poor. When they talked about it in college, I never even thought about it. I could barely pay my bill. But when someone said it to me in my early 30s, I said, yeah, let's go. I had no idea how powerful what I was about to learn would be. I had people who said to me, don't go on the mission trip, just send the money. I can tell you categorically at this point in time, those people don't know how to properly weight what's valuable in a church. And they don't know how to get money from people either. What I discovered as I started going on these mission trips every year was that number one, a properly run mission trip would bond your church in 10 days, like, 10, like uh, a whole year of going to church never could. In 10 days, you spend as much time together as you would sitting through 52 Sabbath school classes and sermons. But the difference is, in those 10 days, you're eating together, working together, singing together, worshiping together, and experiencing adventure together. Now, I don't want to say this in the wrong way, but I only have so much time, so I want to tell you that in my 30 plus years of pastoring, I pastored one church. I had a little district. Well, I was an intern first, both in two larger churches. Then I pastored a little church district. Then I went to a medium sized church for 20 years. And then I went to the current church I've been at for 10 years. And I want to tell you that in all of these churches, by God's grace and to his honor and glory, the principles I'm teaching you right here have completely transformed the culture of the church, the strength of the unity, the financial giving, the missionary mindedness, the joy of coming to church. And what I discovered in those first mission trips was that not only did my people fall in love deeper with God, but they got to love each other more. Now the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 verse 14 that love is the bond of perfection. And I'm here to tell you the Bible also says in Proverbs 19 that it's to a man's glory to overlook an offense. And I'm here to tell you that when you like somebody as opposed to disliking them, when you love somebody and understand them as opposed to not understanding their story and their history, you can overlook their idiosyncrasies and oddities and sometimes relational mistakes a whole lot easier than when you don't like them. Now, I hope this is as simple as can be. But the real bottom line is, I tell my teachers, these Seventh-day Adventist educators, when the people like you, you can do no wrong. And when they don't like you, you can do no right. 
Now, what I'm describing to you is the power of emotion working the right way. And when the emotion is not working the right way because it's to a man's glory to overlook an offense and love conceals a matter, when you have the eyeglasses of Christ on towards the body of Christ, it's much easier to see that growth moment. By the way, I don't think the church is mainly full of hypocrites. I just think it's full of growing people. And like I tell my church, I know more bad things about all of you than anybody else in the congregation. And I love you more. But when the emotion flows the right way in a, re in a relationship, when the love cup is full, you don't come apart at the edges. When your cup is full of water, just imagine me holding, you know, I, I got about five Delta cups with water on that 15-hour flight from Atlanta to Johannesburg. When that cup gets bumped and it's full of love, guess what spills out? Just love. When we get the emotional momentum moving according to the laws and the bonding process of Jesus, everything works better. So, on Monday night, before I get on an airplane on Tuesday, I'm sitting in a room with probably 35 to 40 people, all my elders and all my board. And we're discussing a big discussion about the potential acquisition of a piece of property for a million dollars almost. And I just want to tell you, at the end of 10 years, by God's grace, he's given me the ability to shepherd the people, starting with the leaders and the constitution of the boards, to where God's allowed me to put in place people that are willing to be discipled, people who have a baseline spiritual beginning spot where they are humble enough to learn and admit, yeah, 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 I'm kind of quick to speak. I got a short temper. I'm sorry. Or they'll ignore it, and it's all the pastor's fault or somebody else's. A process of finding a common inspiration with a common maturity, with a, a common belief system. Pretty soon you get a group of people together for whom what it's always been my goal. Now, mind you, the village church that I'm in right now, they weren't holding their tithe back for three weeks, but they weren't doing much better they were holding back the church school subsidy and paying their bills on that. I mean, it's a broke church. And I'm here to tell you, by God's grace, that we went from a tithe base of about a million dollars to a tithe base of $2.5 million. That's a 250% increase. And it's a function of designing the church for the process of bonding. And in that process, mission is at the middle and what happens is the people's hearts open up to give to the world mission, and in the process, they give to their local church more too. So, when I first came to that church, I had an employee, and I was starting to let people come and talk to the church about mission. And what I, that employee said to me one day at a staff meeting, they said, Pastor Ron, in effect, what they said is, we don't have enough money for people to come and ask our people for money. And in effect, what I said is, look, our problem is not money. Our problem is not having enough inspiration and faith to give to the things we're supposed to give to. Because there's nothing that's quite as unifying as a common mission. But when you set your sights very low and your main scope is to look out for yourself, I'll tell you a funny story. A little bitty church maybe 50 members, Monticello, I'll tell you where it's at. In America, where Jefferson grew up, the Constitution, the, the Constitution, one of his main con contributions, it's Monticello. That's in Virginia. But in Indiana, it's Monticello. I went to that little church. They had $10,000 in the bank. I looked around at the church, a lot of gray hair. Of course, I've got a lot of gray hair myself now, but back then I didn't. And I said to myself, if this church doesn't grow, it's going to die. I went to the church and I said, I want to do a video seminar. I want to do it on grief recovery, common human experience. The problem was that church had a little bitty 13-inch black and white TV. 13 inches. I know everything's centimeters here, so that's probably like 50 centimeters. Or no, less than that, 35. I said to them... 
we need to buy a new television. They had $10,000 in the bank. It was there for a rainy day, but I could see the storm clouds gathering, all right? I said, we need to buy a new television. The board said no. So what did I do? 27 years old, married with probably two kids. I went out to the store, and I bought a new television. And back then, 25 inches, that was a big deal. It was back before the TVs were skinny. It had a big cathode ray tube in it, 25 inches. I brought it to the church. We sent out brochures. This poor church didn't think anybody was going to come. And you know what? I'm a praying pastor. And I know unless the Lord builds the house, I'm laboring in vain. So I just started praying, Lord, send the people. You know what? The people came out. And the Monticello church was surprised, and they felt bad. They felt really bad. They felt so bad, they offered to give me the little 13-inch black and white TV. <laughs> if you're going to have a bonded church, the leader's going to have to be patient and know how far to push and when to let up and to lead with a little bit of sacrifice. I can tell you, in that church, there was an old man by the name of Irvin Houston. He did not, he, he turned out to be one of my good friends and supporters, but I preached a sermon there called I Have a Dream, based off Martin Luther King's famous speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. I went to the church board the next, Sabbath, the next Sunday, a day later, and he made fun of me. He mocked me. He said, this church is going to grow so big, we're going to have to add on, and I had made a really radical statement in my sermon. I said, I hope this church can get so busy, and the parking lots were all gravel. I said, I hope this church will get so busy that the weeds won't grow in the parking lot. You know, I don't, you have any gravel parking lots in South Africa? Are the weeds growing in them because almost nobody shows up at your church? Yeah, America has problems too. When I left the church that day, I had gotten about two miles from the church when I felt like a big one-inch piece of steel was wrapped around my chest, and somebody, it was attached to a worm gear, and somebody was turning it and choking the life out of me. Now, I'm a very healthy person. I've never had breathing problems in my whole life. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt. I pulled the car over the road, barely able to breathe, and I just prayed, Lord, help me. And he delivered me from what I believe was a demonic attack against me. That little church had to make their mind up. They had that $10,000 in the bank. What I'm trying to tell you is this. There's nothing as unifying as a common vision. And there's nothing as strengthening to the pastor or the leaders if they'll lead by faith and sacrifice. So we have to spend some money to do an evangelistic series. We were going to spend three whole thousand dollars, which 30 years ago was a lot of money. They didn't want to spend it. So God made it easy for them. He had already done the little television thing. But on the day that we voted the budget, he sent $2,000 in the mail. I mean, God is so patient. And then before the series was over, he had sent us another $1,000, so he made it cost us net neutral. Now, nothing will unify your church like a common mission. But if your leaders are not committed to the mission, if they're really committed to their own security, their own estate, their own 401k, whatever it's called in South Africa, their retirement plan, if the leaders are committed to the mission of the church and they share a common vision, it has an updraft value. But those leaders have to be committed to a shared sacrifice. And then they have to be able to lead through shared crises and challenges. And then, to have a well-bonded church, you have to share through the cycles of joy. Now, I had a uh, pastor that worked with me for a little while. He teaches at uh, Southwestern Adventist University in Keene, Texas now. And this is what he said to me. He said, you don't really bond until you laugh together. Some people are all about work. They don't know how to have fun together. And there's proper fun and improper fun. But one of the keys to bonding 
is actually having a full spectrum of human relationships that are shared. Now let's just, let's get really biblical for a few minutes. See if you can finish the scripture. And don't forsake the assembling together as some are in the manner of doing, but all the what? The more so as you see the day approaching. Now, the devil's trying to tear this church apart. We can argue about women's ordination. We can argue about COVID. We can argue about all kinds of things. And mind you, as a preacher, I believe that these things are worthy of some discussion. But they cannot be allowed to be the lead dynamics of a congregation or the congregation will be polarizing all the time. And some of you have watched the Village Church and you know that over the last three years, the Village Church took a strong stand on freedom to choose, not on to get the vaccine or not to get the vaccine. I never could have done that if I did not have a very unified leadership team who shared a common vision and they shared enough common experience together to bond. The first step to bonding is a shared common experience. And if you don't come to the church socials and you don't come to Sabbath school, you don't come to church, if you don't have enough shared common experience, you don't have a bond. It doesn't matter to me that you think Saturday is the Sabbath. Yes, it's a measure of a bond, but it's not much. It's important also that when we have a shared common experience that we guard our heart. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Chapter 13, verse 5, as it's going through the attributes of love, it says that love thinketh no what? Evil. Do you know that if you're going to have a bonded church, you're going to have to have the experience of Christ so that you're not stumbling over all of your fellow church members' mistakes and faux pas. And again, when you get that emotional river going the right way, it's a lot easier. People who like me, they can say, yeah, that's Pastor Kelly. He's good at this. He's not good at that. People that don't like me, I'm just a bowl in a china cabinet to them. Love thinketh no evil. When you get bonded properly, it's so much easier to live that out. Now, when we come to the church, take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 27. You're going to have some problems. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, quite a bit more this afternoon. But in Proverbs chapter 27, you're going to find the key to problem management. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 5. It says, better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. I'm hoping that that verse really kind of means love that's not been expressed. Love that hasn't maybe even developed yet. But it's better to be openly rebuked than to live in an environment where there's not a resplendent amount of love. Verse 6 is where I'm going, though. Faithful are the wounds of a what? Friend. But deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. So imagine what happens to a church and the emotional fabric is so loosely woven that when you get to a crisis, let's say somebody you know is having an affair with somebody and they're a member of your church. Or let's get even more basic than that. Let's say you're in a nominee committee and -and so-and-so has been nominated for a job, but there's a glaring part of their life that's out of whack. And while they've got the gifts to do this job, uh, the presentation of their person is going to work contradictory. Let's say they're nominated to be in a kid's Sabbath school and they're, they're, they're living in such a way, let's say they're wearing a bunch of jewelry and your church still believes that simplicity of dress matters and you don't want that modeled to all the kids. And I had this happen. I've had this happen various times in my church. Jewelry's not the ultimate sin. It's just not fitting for that, at least. It's tempting for that nominating committee to say, Pastor, why don't you go talk to that person? It's the foolish pastor who ignores texts like this and says, okay, I'll do it. Because according to this text, who should be talking to the person? The person closestly, most closely bonded to the person. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And when we don't understand the laws of bonding, and when the pastor's foolish enough to accumulate all the negative emotional damage that comes 
from straining and stretching relationships instead of saying, no, elder, you're closer, or no, Mrs. Elder, you're closer. You should be the one that has this. And when people are afraid to process through the bonds that will actually strain, because, you know, some of you lift weights. You know how that works? You strain the muscle, the fibers break down, you give it two days, they build back stronger. Some churches will never, ever strain their emotional relationships, which means they stay forever weak. Now, how you do it matters. You know, I can remember as a kid once, my uncle had his weights, and I didn't know how to pick them up, and I hurt my back. So there are some laws that govern these things. But the person who never emotionally, relationally strains a relationship ends up with weak relationships. We're kind of back to what I said in the previous sermon. If you have chronic dysfunction, the only way out of it is through acute pain. When you have a tumor, it's going to hurt to have the tumor taken out. But when it's out, you'll be healthier. When these relational laws govern the fabric of society and the church, and we understand them, when we actually spend enough time together to develop some emotional attachment for each other, when we actually share a common vision, when we actually strain relationships appropriately, but there's one there to strain, it's not just a vague acquaintance. Most people don't leave the Seventh-day Adventist church over the doctrines, although some do. Most leave over wounded relationships, and those relationships could be so much stronger if the church was the center of our lives. Now, did you hear what I just said? Adventism is in trouble primarily because the church is not the center of the people's lives anymore. But in some of these countries, especially where they've been persecuted, they come together on Friday night, and they stay together all day Sabbath, and they're very deeply bonded because they're living in hardship. Persecution bonds the church. When I got to that middle of church where I stayed 20 years, it was a big church. I mean, a big physical plant, easily 10,000 plus square feet, big octagon, modern church. But it needed a new roof. In the board meeting, we had to go through all the usual struggles but I knew something. It was a 312 pitch, which is not a very steep pitch to use American measures. And I knew that we could change the roof out ourselves. Somebody in the board said, well, what if it leaks? We're not professionals. When I left the board meeting, we voted to do it. When I left the board meeting, it was probably only a 15-year-old church by that point in time. One of the older members, don't ever discount yourself, senior members. One of the old members caught me in the, in the middle of the hallway. I was in my mid-30s. And they said, Pastor, when the professionals put the roof on, it leaked. <laughs> we put over 100 people on that roof. We, lit, we were on a major highway. People were slowing down on the highway to see all those ants crawling all over that roof. We purposely did not use the pneumatic nailers. Everybody had a hammer and nails. We came out on Sabbath evening, Saturday night, after the sun went down, and one of our contractors, and by the way, I love the contractors. If you're a contractor, you're high up on my list, especially if you're devoted to the cause of God because you're the people who know how to solve problems and you can get things done. He had brought out his big forklift, ex extenuating forklift, and we started tearing the roof off with big floodlights on Saturday night. And the goal was to replace 100 squares which is a colossal amount of shingles in one day. We had young kids. We, safety was a big deal. And I want to tell you something. We got to a place in the afternoon where one of the former contractors said to me, I don't think we're going to get it done. We did finally break out for an hour or two the pneumatic nailers. And at the end of the day, we all ate ice cream together. And I want to tell you something. That shared experience where we took on a challenge, we saved a lot of money and we bonded a lot, kept making us together. That church once sponsored around 50 churches in India. They raised 400, 300 and some thousand dollars to build churches in India. They put thousands of packages in the mail with Steps to Christ. They built churches all around the world. Their finances went from a quarter of a million dollars of tithe to $500,000 to $750,000. You know why? Because the common mission with a common love and a common understanding and good leadership created a bonded family that had, it's like, what do they say? In America, they say it's hard for a horse to kick while it's pulling in the harness. 
Do you have any saints like that in South Africa? And what we did as a church is we brought mature people who knew how to dialogue with each other and were not easily offended in processing places like the board. We started living out a common mission. We started sharing common experiences. We opened our heart up for the need of the world. And pretty soon what we found is, is that we had joy in gathering, purpose in gathering, and we were a family, a good family. And so when you go back to your churches, to whatever role that you hold, I want you to remember that there's so much power in positive emotion and goodwill, but you don't get it unless you spend time together. Let me give you one more story. This may be a bad story to tell here. Do you have potlucks in South Africa? All right, this will be a bad story then. I had an old man in one of my churches who was very uncouth. He was not cultured. And one day, somebody saw him in the kitchen take his finger and dip it into one of the dishes and eat out of it. We once had a lady get a grasshopper and a can of green beans at one of our potlucks, and she refused to keep coming back. But that was out of our control. As a pastor, I feel like it's my job to love everybody, and I really want to like everybody. So I've got to keep my heart pure. The Bible says, guard your heart, for out of it is the issues of life. So this older man and I are not natural connective because... He's got some bad habits that are just very distasteful to me. But it turned out that during a week of prayer, every night, he was sitting right up at the front, and we'd pray together. And so he'd pray in this pew, and I'd pray in this pew, and he prayed the most beautiful prayers for me. Now, there's no deeper bond than a spiritual bond. And that's why a good marriage is the best when it's bonded around Christ. But as that man prayed for me, guess what happened to me? (laughs) I still didn't want him dipping his unwashed hands in my potluck dish. But my heart completely turned to that man. If he had not gathered at a spiritual meeting, and I had not gathered at a spiritual meeting, and we had not shared a common repeating night-by-night spiritual experience, we would not have been bonded. I'm trying to get a main point across to all of you, and it's this. There should be no more bonded place on the face of the planet than the church of God. We have to work at it. My wife and I married for almost 40 years now. Man, there's a tremendous bond in the beginning. It's called infatuation. There's a reason. You overlook all kinds of things. Then you get married, and you've got to work those things out. But when that bond is tight, my kids are benefited, my church is benefited, I'm benefited, and my wife is benefited. I've come to see life and leadership through only one set of eyes. How bonded are we? When my board meets, I spend 45 minutes in worship. That's not me preaching to them. I probably talk to them for five or 10 minutes, maybe 15. The next thing we do is pray in small groups. I try to avoid group praying where I pray for everybody as often as I can because when you pray with the person next to you, you bond. And then after we pray together, we sit around for the next 10 minutes and we recount the goodness of God by praising Him. What am I doing? I'm bonding my church to each other and to God in the midst of a spiritual experience. I'm also challenging my church We're building a college in El Salvador. We've built with another organization over 100 churches at $10,000 a piece. I know that a common mission will bond my church. And after lunch, I'm going to talk with you about problem solving. And I'm going to lay down about eight steps. And if you follow them and you live by them, you can survive most problems that come into your marriage, your parenting, or your church life, or your occupation. But the way I look at life now is I look at everything through the eyes of how connected am I to you because I have five pastors on my staff, a Bible worker, a full-time secretary, 
These people move in a solid unit of oneness, in a high-maintenance relationship where if they like each other and love each other, they're ten times more efficient than when they've got petty differences working against them. I want to encourage you to look at your life through the eyes of bonding. How bonded am I? And of course, some bonds shouldn't exist. There's an alien bond. I will, I'll talk about that for a few minutes when we get together. How do people end up divorcing? How do adultery start? They don't start with two people being in the same physical space. They start with an emotional bond, which everyone denies exists. <laughs> so I'll go through Donald Joy's 12 steps of bonding real quick, then I'm gonna take you through the steps of resolving problems. The glass ceiling on your life is as high as your problem solving skills. And once you figure out how to do that, then your bondingness goes to much deeper levels. And I tell you, I've had some major conflicts with people in my church, some lasting hours and hours long. I'll probably tell you about one person I had a five-hour conflict with. He's now one of my best friends because we actually process it all the way through to the end. I learned something, he learned something. In the meantime, folks, look at life through the eyes of how connected we are. If you're really connected, life's much easier, although staying connected requires a lot of work. Let's pray. We'll consider this concluded. And for those that are able, we'll go through conflict and its resolution on the other side. Lord, save us from thinking ill. Save us, Lord, from being loosely connected. May we gather together and all the more so as we see the day approaching. They sold things and shared in the apostolic church, Lord. I suspect that time's coming for us too. Teach us how to love, Lord. You said they'll know we're your disciples when we have love one for another. I'm afraid, Lord, some of us have roots of bitterness. I didn't talk much about that. May we be honest because dishonest people cannot bond. And I'm praying for good leaders, Lord. Leaders that will structure bonding environments. And now, Lord, I pray bless us as we take a break, enjoy some food. May we find ourselves more deeply bonded as the church in South Africa through this camp meeting as well, which we've made a priority. Guide us now and bless us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.